Welcome to our lecture on Chapter 3 in Applied Statistics and Probability for Engineers. This chapter we're going to be talking about discrete random variables and probability distributions. So as we get started, I'm going to go over what we're going to be talking about throughout this chapter. First, we're going to talk about discrete random variables, then probability distributions and probability mass functions, then cumulative distribution functions, mean and variance of a discrete random variable, discrete uniform distributions, and lastly, the binomial distribution. I know a lot of this right now just seems like a bunch of crazy words, but I promise by the end of the chapter you'll be able to understand it all. So at the end of chapter 2, we discussed what a random variable is. A random variable maps all the possible outcomes for a certain event. So really, there's three different types of random variables, and we touched on discrete and continuous a little bit before. So there's one called a Bernoulli random variable, and a Bernoulli random variable then is a random variable that only has two possible outcomes. A discrete random variable is one that has finite possibilities or countable possibilities, and a continuous random variable then is one that has either infinite possibilities or ones that there are just too many to count. So in this chapter, we're going to be focusing all of our efforts on discrete random variables, and we will continue with continuous random variables in the next chapter. So let's look at an example. Once again, nothing to calculate because statistics is more of a vocabulary class, but rather one that will just show us the different parts of what we're looking at. So a voice communication system for a business contains 48 external lines. At a particular time, the system is observed and some of the lines are being used. Okay, so if I let x denote the number of lines that are in use, and then x can assume any integer of values 0 through 48. So we know this is a discrete random variable because I can't really have two and a half lines being used at once. So it's going to be integers ranging from 0 lines in use, so no phone calls are coming in, to 48 external lines because we're told 48 right here in the paragraph. So it can range all the way from 0 to 48. So then the system is observed at a random point in time. So for example, if 10 lines are being used, then lowercase x equals 10. We've seen that before written as the probability of capital X equaling lowercase x equals something. And that then is the probability that my random variable equals one of those values in its range or in this case 10. So that's just a simple example to kind of dissect our new vocabulary. So now that we're a little more familiar with a discrete random variable, let's talk about how it's described. So we have something that's called a probability distribution, and a probability distribution helps us describe probabilities that are associated with possible outcomes of our variable. A probability distribution of a discrete random variable can be either a list of possible values with their probabilities or a formula that's used to calculate the probability in response to an input of the random variable's value. So we will see both of these in different scenarios. So this first one is the one we will most commonly see. When I hear the word distribution, I usually think of a graph, but that's not entirely the case. The graph comes when we have a possible value with its probabilities that are plotted. However, in general, a probability distribution is just some x values and their associated y values. So for discrete random variables, the probability distribution is called a probability mass function. So keep that in mind. A probability distribution is a probability mass function. This picture or this graphic is in your book and I actually really like it. Suppose we have a loading on a long thin beam. So this is like a long thin beam and I have these loadings or these arrows. So these arrows take place at discrete points, meaning very countable or integer points on this line. This represents then the probability distribution where the beam is my number line over a range of x values and the probabilities represent the mass. So here I have these loads or these forces or this mass that are actual probabilities. That's why it's called a probability mass function. So I have these x values and see how these are kind of different heights? Those are my probabilities. 
So they're distributed evenly along these x values. Okay, so let's look at this. How we would graph a distribution function. So I have x values, which are my values of my random variable. So I have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 in this case. And then my y-axis is going to be the probabilities that correspond to those values. The probability of getting a 0 in this event would then be up here at 0.6561. The probability of getting a 1 would be 0.2916, and so on. So I would have that corresponding probability over here, and so on. So basically we're just graphing probabilities. It's no fancier than that. So just think down here, it, the y-axis is my probability, the x-axis is the possible x values. So another important thing about probability mass function, actually the rule of probability mass function, is that all of my probabilities have to add up to 1. So that's all this says, is that all of the individual probabilities, so starting from i equals 1 to n, Individually, we would sum them up and then they would add up total to one. So if I were to add up all five of these probabilities, they would add up to the number one. So that's one way to check to see if something is a probability mass function. If that holds true, then yes, it's a probability mass function. Okay, so for a discrete random variable x with possible values as x1, x2, dot, 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 a probability mass function is a function such that, and then we have to have these three rules. So such that the individual probabilities are greater than or equal to zero, okay? Such that the total of all the probabilities equals one, and such that the individual probability is equal to the probability that my random variable equals some value of x. So that makes sense, right? So the probability that my random variable equals some x is the same as the probability of that random variable at a certain point, which is that sub i. Okay, so if we look at this graph again, I really like this little example in your book. So let's look at each rule. So if we look at each of these points right here, each of the y values is a probability, so each of these y values, as you can see, is greater than zero. So check number one is met. What about number two? If I find the probability of each of those, so I wrote it out here, the probability that x equals zero is this, probability that x equals one is this, and so on. This is really the probability that my random variable equals one, right? Then I add all of those up and those all equal one. So number two is also met. Number three, my y value or my probability is equal to the probability that my random variable equals some value x. And yes, that holds true as well. So here, all three of these scenarios are met. So yes, it is a probability mass function. That's it for this section on probability distributions.